Hello, this is a gentle Halloween tale of an ancestral nature, written by Mrs. Belloc Lowndes in 1929, entitled The Unbolted Door, and it comes from a collection called When Churchyards Yawn by Cynthia Asquith, who edited and put them together, and also contributed the final story in this collection. So, The Unbolted Door. Leave that door alone, young fella, and remember once for all that it's never to be locked or bolted. Not that there's any fear of its being locked, as the master always has the key on him. Mrs. Torquil heard the muffled words, Coat, their seventy-year-old butler instructing the new footman in slow, impressive tones as is the way of butlers when addressing their humble subordinates. But this subordinate belonged to the new dispensation, so he answered back. That's a funny idea, that is. It may seem funny to you, Senior Stranger, Henry, but it's only a sad one to me. Sad? Why is that, Mr. Cope? From where Anne Torquil had stayed her steps at the door of her bedchamber, she heard the now quavering, long familiar old voice answer, "'Twas this way it happened, Mr. John, and a ni rare nice young chap he was, was not just put down killed by his colonel when he didn't come back from what was then styled a raid in the enemy lines. He was just reported missing. Cruel I called it then, and cruel I calls it now, for twas bound to encourage false hopes. It must have done, Mr. Coat. The young voice had become grave. Mrs. Tarkwell knew well enough what missing meant. But the master, he just couldn't bring himself to believe his son, his heir too, mind you, had gone, so to speak, forever. I mind well how a few days after the armistice, Mr. Torquil came along one night, just as I was looking up, and he says, says he, just leave the door on the small hall as it is, coat. Master John always came into the house that way because of the shortcut from the gate. Many soldiers are coming back now from Germany who was put down as missing. So my son may walk through that door any day. That's what he said then, poor gentleman. And that door, Henry, has never been locked or bolted since. The men's footsteps died away and something stirred in Anne Torquil's unhappy, atrophied heart. How very strange that she should not have known till tonight of her husband's order. It was true that, at all ages past babyhood, the boy had been wont to burst through the outer door of what was called the small hall, with a cry of, Mother, where are you? Upstairs? And yet, dearly as he loved her, close as they were to one another, she had always known that John had cared most for his inarticulate father. She was so moved now that something of the frightful anguish of six years ago came back, and restlessly she began to walk up and down the beautiful bedroom. Many of her friends envied her. How piteous that to her it should be a room of intolerable memories. In the wide Jacobean bed, where she now spent her often wakeful nights, had been born the son whose coming had seemed inevitable. Convinced that as to this matter she would be as lucky as in all else, she had laughed at the thought that her baby could be a girl. How often in the last six years she had wished she had died on the glorious day her boy was born. Her good friend then, and still her good friend, Dr Maynard, the old village doctor, had taken it on himself more than once during the perfect years which had followed John's birth to hint that it was a pity the child had no brother, no sister, to share his delightful nursery. But she, Anne Torquil, 
had been willfully deaf to such advice. Always, during the whole of her happy, spoilt young life, she had done what she wanted, and never had she done anything that she had def not definitely wished to do. She had given her Jack a splendid son, what good old coat called an heir. That, surely, was quite enough. Suddenly, now, she stopped in her pacing opposite a carved wooden mirror. She had been standing just here during her last happy moment of life. It was the autumn of 1918. Her husband was home convalescing from what had been a severe wound. There were rumours of peace, and they were confidently, confidently expecting their boy home on his first leave. At exactly three o'clock, on a fine early October day, there had come what had been, then, a very familiar knuckle knock on her door. Even when she was a bride of seventeen, and the two were more like a pair of happy children than a married couple, Jack had always knocked before he came into his wife, Anne's room. Blithely she had called out, Come in! And he had come in, with a telegram, open in his hand. It was as if she could hear now, tonight, six years later, the sound of his hoarse voice uttering her name, and then, when she had put up her arm with an instinctive violent movement to ward off the blow, the further words, Thank God, not killed, my darling, only missing. Only missing. And John's father had gone on, not only hoping against hope, but firmly convinced, that, from the depths of some German prison, or even from some German mental home, the boy would come back. She, from the first, in dry-eyed despair, had felt no hope at all. In her husband's obstinate, what to herself, she more than once harshly called his idiotic optimism, had pained, exasperated, sometimes maddened her. She stared now as if hypnotised at her own reflection in the dark glass of the mirror. Though she would be 45 on her next birthday, it was true, as tiresome people so often told her, that she still, at times, looked like a girl. Time had scarcely touched her lovely face and slender, rounded figure with his rude finger. But Jack Torquil, not yet 50, might have been 10 years older than his age. For the first time in her life tonight, Anne asked herself, with a touch of unease, if her husband was as unhappy as she was herself. This evening she had watched him sitting hunched up in an uneasy chair, a book in his hand on the other side of the fire. Suddenly he had taken up a pencil. It was a thing Jack Torquil was given to do, and it always irritated his wife, and marked a passage in the book he was reading. Looking up, he had thrown her a queer, shamed, pleading look, and when he had risen and left the library to go through his usual ritual of taking a turn out of doors with the three dogs, she had walked across the room to see what it was that he had marked in his book. And then she had been at once annoyed, diverted, and, maybe, a little touched, for what her husband had marked had been two lines, the first ridiculously familiar the second to this moment unknown to her. It is the little rift within the lute that by and by will make the music mute. And now, while slowly undressing, she remembered the two lines Jack had marked. What he, no doubt, still thought of as a little rift between them was in actual fact a chasm which was ever yawning wider and wider. Yet once, only once, in their now long joint life, had she spoken the bitter words to him. It had been years ago, at a time when he was still full of hope, and she, alas, starkly hopeless, as to their son's possible return. The lover in him had awakened, and when his lips had sought hers, she had said fiercely, Never, Jack, never again! So literally had he accepted her decree that not once since then had he even knocked on the door of her room they shared so blissfully for twenty-three, twenty-one years. Today, the eve of Armistice Day, had been an intolerable day and Anne told herself that next year they would have people here 
for the first fortnight of November. They were rich, hospitable, both in their what quite different ways popular. But the real reason why they were never alone, excepting for the Christmas holidays and part of November of each year, was that a dual solitude becomes intolerable when shared by a man and a woman who were once ardent, exultingly happy lovers. As Anne Torquil got into her great bed, the stable clock began to strike twelve, ushering in another armistice day. And, as she lay back smarting, difficult tears rose to her still undimmed eyes. The thought of her boy was very near to her tonight, so near indeed that an overwhelming wish to gaze on his pictured face came over her. Slipping out of bed, she went over to a painted cabinet, where she kept certain sacred, secret things. Among them was her ador husband's adoring letters, each beginning, My darling little love, written during their short engagement. Also, all her son's photographs from babyhood. She had a sketch of him done by Sargent when he was at Sandhurst. That now hung in his father's bedroom. There was no portrait of him in any other part of the house, which knew him no more. Some of their later friends did not know that they had ever had a child. Unlocking the drawer in which lay all of the photographs of John, she took out the last one, taken of him just after he had received his commission and wearing his first uniform. While she gazed into the boyish face, he seemed to be smiling proudly, confidently, merrily up at her. And as she put it back in the drawer, she remembered a clumsy attempt, most kindly meant, of sympathy on the part of their vicar. He had met her during one of the long, lonely walks she had taken that first year of woe, in between her still strenuous war work, for, after the armistice, Torkelton House had gone on for a long time being a soldier's convalescent hospital. And... Who being dead yet liveth, the vicar had said in a low voice. Throwing her head back, she'd exclaimed, You know, my husband is still quite convinced that John was not killed. He thinks he may come back any day. With a startled look, but making no attempt to answer her, the would-be comforter had gone his way. Today, at almost the same place, oddly enough, she had had an encounter with old Dr Maynard, which had not hurt so much as angered her. He had retired in 1919, and she never saw him alone now. But this time his only son, a son the war had spared, had dropped him from their car so that he might have a little walk. The old man had taken her hand in his and said feelingly, I should like to think you happy, dear Mrs. Torquil. And... As she had shaken her head, she couldn't pretend to him. He had gone on with a touch of real admiration in his feeble voice. You're wonderful. You don't mind my saying so. But how young you keep. Why, this afternoon you might be twenty-five instead of nearly forty-five. Yes. And I do fit still feel young, worse luck. I'd give a good deal to feel old, Dr Maynard. And then she had said a word about her husband, which brought the colour rushing up into her face. The doctor had always been chary of his words, but every word had always told. Can't you bring yourself to be kind to him? He had said, looking straight into her still lovely face. She had answered at once and very coldly, not in the way you mean. Shaking his white head sadly, he had taken her hand in his again. You must forgive an old friend, eh? She had nodded quickly, but she had felt then and she felt now that she could not forgive that, yes, impertinent question. The twelfth stroke of the clock fell on the still air, and all at once she heard the electric light being turned out in the hall below, followed by the sound of her husband's footsteps coming up the stairs. There came over her an odd, unexpected impulse just to go out and bid him good night. But she restrained that impulse. All the same, she walked across to the door and, turning off the light, noiselessly opened it a little way. 
Jack Torquil was making his way up the easy stairs with the steps of an old man. Though, as she and Dr Maynard both knew, he was still young at heart, however deeply grief and hope deferred, had scarred his face. And st still feeling moved by what their old manservant had unconsciously revealed, she waited to hear those slow footsteps making their way into the room, which was no longer called Mr Torquil's dressing room. And then it was as if her heart stood still, for the handle of the unbolted door in the hall below turned in the darkness. Then there came an upward rush of cold air, followed by her husband's startled shout, Who goes there? There was a moment's pause, and after that pause, as if from infinitely far away, there rang out two words in a voice she had never thought to hear again, even in another life, for Anne Tocqueville had come not to believe in the promise the vicar had repeated, thinking to comfort her. And the words uttered in her son's voice pierced her innermost soul, for, poor father, was all her beloved had come back to say. Then she heard Jack Torquil's eager, joyful, John, my dear, dear boy, and the sound of his feet pounding down the stairs. And she rushed out to the circular gallery. She heard the handle turn again in the darkness. The lights below were put full on, and looking over the balustrade, she saw her husband standing in the empty hall, staring with bewildered eyes at the closed door. At last she turned, and looking up, saw her pale face and wide open eyes gazing down. You heard him too, Anne. Straightening herself, she ran round the gallery and so downstairs. There, with what had become a way of forgotten tenderness, she took his hand. Of course I heard him too. The door opened and he came in with the wind. Having said what was in his dear mind, he went back, but back. Jack, where? Where? Later that night, as Anne lay in his arms, John's father muttered, He came back for you, my darling, to comfort you. That was quite right. For me, Jack? Oh, no. But he did, little love. Surely you heard what he said. And she felt the surprise in his voice. She whispered, What did he say? To you? Only what you heard. Only the two words, Anne. Dear mother. He waited a moment, and then he said humbly, for he was a very simple kind of man. Just to let you know, dearest, and perhaps to let me know too, that all is well with the child. <laughs> 